Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think my job's going to be easier now. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in, and, and thank you very much for having me. Certainly my pleasure to be here for you, with you today. Uh, so I want to talk about relationships between software engineering teams and the security teams they work with. So I've been in security pretty much my whole career, and this is definitely one of the more complicated relationships that I've had to navigate. Uh, but I do think it's important that these groups work together. And I want to talk a bit about why have these relationships been problematic and maybe what we can do about it. But um, I work at Netflix, so I think it's important to start with movie trivia. So does anybody recognize this uh, handsome fella on the right-hand side or maybe the movie it comes from? Yes, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, which happens to be streaming on Netflix if you haven't seen it. Um, I'm going to give some spoilers for this movie, but I think it's about 40 years old, so hopefully you'll forgive me. So the bridge keeper in, in the movie, if you want to cross the bridge, you go talk to the bridge keeper, and he's going to ask you some questions, right? which seems reasonable. Uh, but the problem is you, have no, you would have no reason to know the answers to the questions he's going to ask. And if you get them wrong, you don't just like come back the next day and maybe try again. He shoots you into a pit of lava. So it's pretty, pretty serious consequences for um, getting the wrong answers. But I think this is how software engineers think about the security people they work with, right? They're, they're, they're kind of like strange looking and they, they ask me these confusing questions. I don't know how they're making decisions. They're trying to slow me down. They're trying to stop me from getting where I want to go. But I don't want to be too one-sided. So this is how security teams think about developers, right? They're, they always want to use the, the latest technology. They're not thinking about the risk that they're, that they're exposing the business to. But when you, when you dig in a little bit to what motivates each of these groups, it's really not surprising. So developers, right, this is kind of the mantra for the modern developer. Of course, this is from Facebook from a few years ago. But the idea is that if you're not breaking things every once in, every once in a while, you're probably not moving fast enough. Because we all know in developers, when they deliver cool stuff, right, they get their pictures taken, they get gold medals, they get, you know, they're famous, right? But security teams, this is kind of our mantra. So we spend a lot of our time and energy trying to prevent bad things from happening. And one strategy to prevent bad things from happening is to just prevent all things from happening. And that's kind of how we get that, that reputation as being the bridge keeper. Because this is what security people want. We want to be the dog, like laying in front of the fireplace. Everything is quiet. It's calm. No one's bothering us. There's nothing bad happening. So you put these two things side by side, and you say, OK, well, it makes sense that this is going to be kind of problematic, a bit of friction. And maybe this is just kind of the technology equivalent to cats and dogs. Um, and I, I think it's somewhat true. But what I would say is now we really don't have the option to kind of uh, sort of tolerate this level of dysfunction. And it's really driven from, from both sides of this. So on the software side, uh, this, is, this is a quote from, I think, 2011. But the idea is that for many companies, their ability to deliver software is tied directly to their ability to be successful. Right? That's certainly how we think of things at Netflix. Um, and there's just more and more software out there at you know, higher velocity. I think a lot of the, the tools and the innovation and the, the technology here about at this conference is really around letting developers move faster. Right? And on the security side, we, we kind of have this seat at the proverbial table now. Right? Nobody is really thinking, hey, security is not important. So believe it or not, the first half of my career, I spent a lot of time trying to convince people that security was important. But I think generally people get it now. There's really a tremendous amount of demand in the security space. So we hear a lot of, a lot of times about this skill shortage where there's just not enough people. Um, so this kind of, when you take a, a kind of naturally dysfunctional relationship and then you layer on these elements, it can kind of feel like this is a disaster waiting to happen. Like this is just not going to end well. But that's where actually I've, I've had this kind of pleasant professional irony I've been able to experience in say the last 10 years. And that's really that the, the tools and the techniques, the operational patterns, the, the sort of practices that developers are latching onto to deliver faster and to deliver at, at bigger scale, those are the same things that security teams can latch onto to catch up with, the security, with their software teams. And what I believe is, is to make the relationships better and also, I think, meaningfully improve security. So I, I don't know if we can quite end up like this kind of dog and cat relationship, but I do think we can move move closer, and I think we need to. 
So I want to spend the rest of the time talking about what I view as some principles that security teams can embrace, and then I'll talk about a few examples of some open source that we built at Netflix to help kind of make this um, take theory into practice. So the, the first principle I have, I think it's super important, is around transparency. So I think it's, it's important for security teams to expose their decision making and how they're deciding about certain things to developers. It shouldn't be opaque. We shouldn't be like the bridge keeper where who knows how we're going to decide. Uh, we need to think about friction and reducing friction. And any kind of interaction where it could be potentially problematic, we need to think about how we can um, kind of lower the intensity of that and make it go smoother. And then finally, of course, is scale. So if, if we're producing more software, if we have this, this cybersecurity skill shortage, we need to think about how we can more effectively address a really, really large portfolio of software. So let's, I'm going to walk through a couple of examples here um, of some, some work we've done at Netflix. And the first example, it, it seems really simple, but it's probably one of the gnarliest security developer interactions that you can have. And that's how do you provide developers access to what they need? How do you give them the permissions they need? And I'm going to use this opportunity to use my favorite Grace Hopper quote. Um, I don't think she was talking about um, developer permissions. I could be wrong. But when, when you read that quote, it kind of gives you the, the gist of the problem, is that sometimes when you're asking permission, right, it's going to take some time. There's risk that your request will be denied. So sometimes you just kind of want to do your thing, right? You just want to sort of move fast and maybe break some things. And some of what we've seen historically can kind of make that seem like a good idea because usually when you need permissions or you need to some kind of, um, you see need some new capability, you have to go take it to somebody who decides whether or not you get it. Maybe it's a change review board or it's an architecture review board or it's the security team or whatever it is in your organization. Somebody has the opportunity to be the bridge keeper for you, right, and to tell you no. And then on the, on the security side, this is probably, so, I don't remember, but I, it's probably something I've done in my career, but it's sometimes what we'll do in security is we'll see a permission, we'll see a firewall rule, we don't know what it is, so we say, well, let's just disable it and see who complains. But like, this is not the kind of behavior that builds trust. right? If you do this kind of thing and then somebody's app breaks over the weekend and they get paged, they're not going to be happy. So is there, is, can we do something better than this? This seems pretty dysfunctional. So I want to talk about how we do uh, cloud permissions at, at Netflix. So we, we primarily use Amazon Web Services. And I, 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 there's probably a better phrase for this, but I kind of call it the magic of infrastructure as a service. Uh, because I think when you, the cloud is not really about, like, let's take an app from the data center and just kind of run it in the cloud, right? It, to me, I think you really get a lot of leverage when you start using the other services that your cloud provider gives you. So for example, if your app needs to send email to your customers, instead of managing this massive email delivery infrastructure, you just call an API, right? You have a ton of velocity, a ton of capability just by using those services. But this is where some of the, some of the tricky part comes in because then how do you provide the developers the permissions they need? Because it's not clear. The nice thing is that many cloud providers, including AWS, give you pretty detailed information about how you're using the cloud. And so AWS has two services. One's called CloudTrail, the other one's called Access Advisor. That gives you insight into how you're using the cloud. And then what we do, what the security team does, is we then use that information to help make better decisions. So if you were a developer at Netflix and you wanted to create whatever app you wanted to create, what we would do is give you a base set of permissions. So we've observed thousands of applications over many years, and we have a good sense of how most applications interact with AWS. So what we do is we give you that base set of permissions. And you can, you can imagine there, well, it's, it's slightly over-provisioned, right? Because you're going to have permissions you don't need. But we believe that that, to start with, is a pretty good trade-off because it allows every developer, you don't need to come ask anybody. You just kind of go and do stuff. Um, we think that's a good trade-off between velocity and security. And then what we do is once your app is running, we just watch what it does, right? We take a look. Well, what is your app doing? And it doesn't matter what you think your app does or what you ask for. The only thing that matters is the data and what your app, how your app actually interacts with the cloud. And then what we do is we just take a delta. So we have what permissions you have and what you, and what you haven't used, and we just remove those permissions. But what we don't do is we don't just blindly get rid of those and, and you know, hope nothing breaks. What we do is we... We push notifications to developers through our standard change notification platform. 
We let you know, hey, your app hasn't used these permissions. We're going to go ahead and take them away. If you have any questions, go check out the docs. Come, come talk to us in our Slack channel. So if, if everything's fine, there's no, there's no interaction needed, right? It just all works. So we, we built that and we open sourced that as a tool called RepoKid. Um, so if that's at all interest to you, go, go take a look at it. We've gotten a lot of good contributions and feedback from the community. And, and what we do with RepoKid is just transparent and automated, right? There's no, there's no permissions. Be, there, you don't have to ask anybody, right? You just, it just works. It simplifies the developer experience. It minimizes the human interaction. And it, re, and it introduces one of the core philosophies that we have at Netflix from a security perspective is this idea of guardrails instead of gates, right? So how do we let people move fast but stay safe at the same time? It's that kind of balance between velocity and security. Um, so the next item I want to talk about is what we call application risk assessment. Maybe you, you might call this something different at your place of employment. But it's, it's really the process where the security team comes to know context about new systems that are being developed, new applications. And so we can decide how much to invest in, uh, how much security effort to invest. So are you building like the next generation global payments infrastructure that's going to be handling all kinds of credit cards? Or are you building an app to show the lunch menu? Right? So we're going to invest differentially there, as you would imagine. But how do we determine who's building the payments infrastructure and who's building the lunch menu? So what we've typically done as a security industry is we will ask people to fill out spreadsheets or surveys. So tell us about your app so then we can decide what we think about it. The problem is, is that you're, people are going to avoid you. You're not going to catch everybody. And one of, one of the things I've found, which may or may not be surprising to the audience, is that sometimes people lie. And it's not necessarily malicious, but they, they just fill the thing out incorrectly. We, we may ask a question that we think is simple, like, uh, does this application process secure data? Sounds simple. The problem is, what is secure data? Is it intellectual property? Is it credit cards? Is it social security numbers? You're very, it's going to be very unlikely you get consistent answers to this. And also what we typically do with this survey process is we ask one time, right, when you're first building the app. And of course, we all know applications never change functionality over their lifetime, right? It's whatever it's you start with, that's how it always intended. So what we end up with is an incomplete data set that's incorrect and out of date, right? But this is what security teams have to use to in decide where they're going to invest. That's not really a great situation. So one of the, one of the neat things about, you know, as technology uh, advances and as new patterns emerge and as new capabilities emerge, you start to have the um, capabilities to start thinking about problems in, in kind of a fundamentally different way. And I think this tweet from, from years ago captures it pretty well. So Netflix is, a, is a, a large proponent of microservice architectures. And you really, there's, there's just a lot of them. You can't really think about how they all fit together. It doesn't really work in your brain. But you know, there's APIs, there's data, there's you know, IPC mechanisms. You, there's a bunch of information at your disposal to let you automate your reasoning about the environment. So that's what we set out to do. We wanted to create a, an automated risk analysis for microservice architectures. So instead of asking developers to fill out a spreadsheet or a survey or rely on human judgment, what we wanted to do was observe, right? So what's the connectivity look like? You know, how is the cloud configured? How is the app configured? And then we want to develop a risk scoring based on observations that we're making. And we do it continuously, right? It's not just when you first create it. So we, we, we can tell when things change in the environment and we can adjust our, our classification. So the, the heart of this system is based on what we would call an observation. And this is an example observation. This one here we call dependent applications. So just imagine you run a service and say 300 other services depend on your service. I might use that data and say, oh, okay, well, that might be a critical service because you have a, a lot of services are depending on you being available. So what we can do is then use that data to kind of nudge a risk score up or down based on what we think about that. But that's just one observation, right? So there's other observations you have. There's, is the system on the internet? Does it connect to a sensitive data store? How many instances run in its scaling group? Or does it run in a sensitive cloud environment? And really the key is that it's a flexible framework, and you can add more observations. And what we believe is that the more observations we make, the better sense we have about the true risk and the true criticality of the system.
And then what we do is we add that with some other metadata to help our team become more efficient and more effective when they're working through, say, security incidents or security vulnerabilities. So these are, these are other elements of what you might call security supportability. So for any given application, like what's the, what's the, what team owns it? What's their on-call rotation? You know, where is their Jenkins jobs? Where is their source code repo? All these kind of things you want to have at hand when you're working security issues. So it kind of aggregates all this data. And then this is just an example scorecard of a, of a few different measures and sort of how it rolls up. And what you can imagine is that we have a number of measures that are continuously sort of polling and evaluating the environment. And the portfolio is, is, you know, say many or several thousand applications. And then what this does is it provides the security team a good start for thinking about where they're going to invest. So the heart of the system, what we built it on, was called Scumbler. So we open source Scumbler a few years ago. It's really a mechanism for kind of running these kind of data evaluation jobs and bringing them back. Um, and then the takeaways there, really, there's, there, to me, the key is that there's no no human requirement, right? There's nobody, there's no survey provided, there's no wondering, did somebody answer the question correctly? They're just observations, right? And this really helps us move away from that bridge keeper model because it's very clear how we're evaluating the risk score and how we're generating that. So it's objective, it's transparent, and it's continuous. So just wrapping up, kind of getting back to those principles I, I brought up at the beginning, transparency is, is really important. I think this is perhaps the number one thing when you're thinking about building trust between a security team and a software team, you have to be transparent. You can't have this feeling that you're just making arbitrary decisions. So anything we can do with technology that will promote this, we want to invest in. Second, right, friction, lowering friction. To me, the best way to lower friction in a human interaction is to not have the human interaction. Right? So if we can remove the human interaction, it's going to make it much simpler. And then it's also going to lead to that last principle, which is scale. Because we know we're going to be constrained resource-wise but we know somehow the, the engineering teams keep building more software, so we have to figure out how to address that. Um, so I know that was a bunch of information, but I, um, that's it for me. I certainly appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Hi. Thank you.